That was a rough sit. I, on the bright side, I think for the rest of the time that I do this anthology marathon for the month of October and all the Octobers to come, I won't come across another horror anthology that's this bad. I honestly don't think I will. It, even as a movie by itself, it was bad enough. But when I look at how much I loved the original, which I will reiterate in this video, Creepshow 3, how dare it call itself Creepshow? <laughs> I mean, fuck me, man. This is without a doubt the worst horror anthology I've ever seen. And I've seen some bad ones. I, I'm going to go over a few bad ones this month. I am a huge, huge fan of the original film. I mean, I've got the t-shirt. I have the original film. Which, again, I credit this with being the first real horror movie I ever saw. Start to finish. And fell in love with. This very copy was the first DVD I ever got when I was 11. For a while, it was the only DVD I had. And I would actually like to get the Scream Factory Blu-ray just as something to have. Especially for all the features. Also in my top 10 favorite films of all time. I also have this, the first sequel, Creepshow 2. Still not the biggest fan of this film, but at least I can say it's a worthy sequel. Of course, Creepshow 3. I also have the Blu-ray of the Just Desserts Making of documentary. All about the making of the first film. Originally, could only get this on the German uh, DVD release. One of my favorite documentaries. I have the comic book of Creepshow, which I got, I think, when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Technically, the first comic book I ever read. I loved the book as well. And I did just pick up season one of the series which I've only seen one segment so far, the one with the dollhouse, but I actually really enjoyed it. And to go along with that, I have the Pop Funko of the Creep, the one with the comic book. I do still have the box as well. T-shirt. I'm a huge fan of Creep Show. And it's definitely one of the most sentimental films in my life. This, how dare it call itself Creepshow 3. Uh, the only thing it has in common with this film is that it's five stories again. That's it. <laughs> it was directed, it was actually directed by two directors. Uh, Anna Clavel and James D uh, Doodleson which he was also the producer, she was the editor, and it was written by a few different people. Special visual effects by 230 Films. Special makeup effects by Greg McDougal. This movie is, there is not one decent segment in this entire film. There is nothing Stephen King or George Romero about this. It is so poorly written, acted. The stories aren't even anything uh, EC Comics related. None of these stories would ever appear in an EC Comics com book. Came out in 2006. I just remembered to say. I'm actually having more fun putting all this shit back on the shelf than I am talking about this film. There is virtually nobody that stars in this. There. That was the most 
the fun part of this whole video, I'm sure. <sighs> there was one person that uh, I recognized, and that was uh, A.J. Bowen. This was one of his earlier roles. Uh, he would go on to be the guy with the Newberry Comics hat that got decapitated while uh, boning the chick from behind in Hatchet 2. He was, I believe, the youngest son on Your Next. He was also in uh, The Guest and some other stuff. I'm sure other people will tell me just to make sure I know that they know he's in other films. Another big major detriment for this, like, if you go back to my review for A Creep Show 2, I said how, you know, the animation wasn't as strong as the first one. This one completely ditches it. There's nothing comic book about this. There's no uh, animation in between the segments. There was a little bit of animation in the beginning of the film, but... I don't even remember what it was. And at the very end, we pretty much see this cover as the final shot. Uh, each story ends with like a weird yellow, purple, uh, infrared, um, you know, fade or change. Instead, it goes for more of like a, a pulp fiction. It's all in the same world with characters and other things interacting with each other from each story. The five stories are terrible. There's two. There's one that I can appreciate. Not how it came out, but I can appreciate because of what it reminds me of. The rest are fucking garbage stories. Now, I've said before how, you know, people, when they are like 0.01% um, unsatisfied with something, like if in the new Batman movie, his ears are like an inch shorter than in this one book that they like, they'll just call the whole film trash, garbage, dumpster fire without really knowing what trash cinema is. This is a good example. <laughs> there is nothing redeemable or enjoyable about this film whatsoever. I don't, I, I'm so baffled that they're able to call it Creepshow 3. Even more so, for the longest time, that was the only release of Creepshow that you could get. Uh, not one special feature except for a trailer up until Scream Factory came out, or at least in America. This has a 24-minute behind-the-scenes documentary, which I watched because I wanted an explanation. Both Anna Clavel and James Doodleson they even said, because they work together a lot, even the way he worded it was like, we, we were threatening the fan base for about five years that we were going to do Creepshow 3. One guy who plays a professor in one of the segments, but is actually in a couple, he honestly thinks this is the best of the three. He thinks it's the best written. And the funniest. And the most inventive. And the best. While in the same sentence. Saying I know the first was written by Stephen King. And the second was written by George Romero. Screenplay at least. But okay. So 10 minutes in. I'm just going to breeze right through the stories. Because they don't fucking matter. First one is about this girl named Alice. She's this really stuck up high school girl. She, she's talking on the phone to her friends about, you know, 
Everything is so blah, it is so stupid, and oh my god, and wow. You know, just being a stuck-up bitch about everything. She walks home, we see a hot dog stand. There's a kid with a red ball that bounces, hits her in the face. There's this stupid joke about a dog. This kid's walking his dog, and then the dog like goes in the hot dog truck or cart. And then we get the idea the kid is fed his, the hot dog, his dog. Cute, right? Well, she goes home and her dad has this new TV remote. And by this point, I'm like, they're really doing that. How many times have we seen the universal remote? Goosebumps even had an episode of the universal remote. And did it way better than this. It was scarier. It was funnier. Better acted. This. So he's. He's barely engaging with anything she's. A bitching about. Saying oh this one does the volume. This one does the that. This is all oh, huh. Her brother is playing video games or whatever on the floor. Her mother is telling her dinner's ready. And her grandmother is in the back of the room. At one point, her grandmother even says, she'll never get a husband. She has no ass. And everyone laughs at her and she runs off. And that's when the dad says, oh, this one adjusts the brightness or the contrast. And he hits a button. Of course, you get like an effect. And the whole scene starts over again. You know, we see the red ball, hit her in the face, goes home. Only now, her family is African-American. Get it? Because he played with the contrast. And the scene is just on a loop, but with different effects. Like then, he says something about subtitles. Scene starts over. And only now, it's a Hispanic family, and we get subtitles. And then uh, she catches on, s some more stuff happens, and only now she's going through a mutation. We don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know how everyone else seems to be fine, but only she is affected by, like, sh she's the only one that's not affected by the change of the remote, except for the fact she's being mutated. Like, at first, her fingers are fused together, and it's, like, all, like, white and pink and discolored. And then she starts getting boils on her face. And I think she's wearing, like, sandals, and her toes and foot gets all fused together. Until eventually, her whole body is like this. Uh, they even used KY Jelly on the latex uh, the two-faced creature from john carpenter's the thing how there's all those like lines like skin imagine that but with boils and pus and but all over her so she goes inside her family thinks she's a monster chases her out and there's it just when he thought this story could get even more ridiculous because it doesn't explain why she's mutating she runs outside and she runs into this professor who's like I want to be normal and he's like but you are normal and then I guess he has a remote Hits a button, and now she's turned into a rabbit. Just a regular rabbit. And her name is Alice. The name of the story is Alice. It better not be a joke on Alice in Wonderland. Then her family comes out. Her dad has a gun. He's like, oh, don't worry, detective, whatever your surname is. Yeah, he's a detective, but 
He acts like world's dumbest dad. And then he says something out. This is my, oh, this is my buddy, Alice. And they're all like, oh. And the mom's like, Alice, that's a pretty name. As if they, so Alice has been wiped from existence. At least in the family. So then we get that like yellow and blue purple sort of uh, infrared look going to the next story. This is the one with A.J. Bowen. And I guess this is like the sci-fi story. It's it's a guy with a radio. This guy, he's uh, uh, he works security at this place. He's very lonely. He buys this radio off a homeless guy who, he's an annoying character because all he does is yell. But just some of his lines, I actually thought were funny. Or the way he said them. Like, he tells them, like, like, a tenner, no a tenner. Ten dollar, three dollar. A tenner, no a tenner. He's like, oh, why is that one less? Is like, uh, what do you say? Like, less radio, more a tenner. It says something about, asks about the one with no antenna. And he's like, no, just get some duct tape, copper, no antenna. <laughs> he buys whichever one, takes it home to listen to it, and the radio talks to him. As a female voice addresses him by name, starts telling him what to do. It's supposed to be like this soft sort of almost seductive voice. Imagine like Hal 9000, if it was you know, Gal 9000, a girl. <clears throat> Starts telling him, you know, at first clean his apartment, you know, eat better. And eventually he, she tells him to do other things like go into this uh, sort of place where pimps are and steal shit, steal money. And of course, and this is another one where the ending do just doesn't make sense. Uh, well, first he, he kills he also, I think, tries to kill a hooker. No, this was so boring and forgetful. I'm already forgetting the story. He does start stealing stuff, and I think he tries to kill a prostitute, but the prostitute ends up killing him. And then, uh... Which he even destroys his radio eventually. Then this other hooker kills him. <clears throat> and then this the pimp from before kills the hooker, gets in his car, and he's got a boombox with the same voice. And here's one thing about this movie. The segments don't always end. By that, I mean they don't have a closing. You know, opening, story wrap up closing or like a payoff or a twist or like an actual ending they either just abruptly end like right at the point of something or if they do have like an ending ending it doesn't make any sense or have any explanation as to why it's ending that way so let me get into the third story which the the third one is just, third story is called Call Girl, and I think Call Girl, her name's Rachel, she appeared in uh, the last story. It's just pointless. A Call Girl, also a serial killer. Uh, this one was written by, let's see who wrote this one at the back. 
No, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. But it, <clears throat> I think we see her kill a couple people. Uh, this one guy, Victor, goes to the call girl website, calls her, and says, I'm looking for a companionship for the night. She kind of laughs at him, but goes anyway. And I don't know why, <laughs> but... Uh, while I was watching this, this guy Victor, played by Ryan Carter, he kind of reminded me of Jay from uh, Red Letter Media, and I really like Red Letter Media, so it's kind of an insult to them, but uh, uh, that's just what he reminded me of. And apparently this segment also has Eileen Dietz as a homeless woman who who I guess was the the face of a Pazuzu on The Exorcist when you would actually see the face of Pazuzu appear randomly. So, talk about falling from grace. But anyway, so, <clears throat> I mean, th this segment is mostly filler. Because once she gets to Victor's house, which we get this one scene where they're walking through his house, and we see three people dead, sort of, like, hung up on the wall. You're kind of getting the idea, okay, maybe this isn't his house, it's that family. And we're going to have, like, these two killers going at it. <clears throat> but it takes a stupid turn, just like all the other stories do. We have this really long scene of them in bed. He's blindfolded, tied up. She kisses his chest and stomach. Just drags it out. Not enough story here to make anything. The guy who wrote it, uh, I want to see. Pablo Papano. Okay. On the behind the scenes featurette, he said he wanted to do a story about this character, which he says, I believe. He said, the chick from Monster, <clears throat> which this was before Monster, I think this was before Monster came out. No, that was 2005. You mean Eileen Warnos, a real person, <laughs> a notorious serial killer? But anyway, they're in the bed, and then she stabs him in the chest a bunch of times, makes happy noises, if you know what I mean. And then she walks off. She hears his voice saying, You killed me. You killed me. She had a pillow over his face. And when she removes it, turns out he's apparently a vampire. Which I was thinking either vampire or demon. I guess it's a vampire. And their idea of a vampire is the big wide mouth, like... Amanda Bierce and Fright Night. Which he really just looks like Baraka from a Mortal Kombat. Ironically enough, and to this movie's credit, looks more like Baraka than Baraka in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. And I mean the the makeup isn't bad. And, I mean it is really poor. Especially when you consider Tom Savini's work in this. In fact, the way the mouth is, he kind of looks like Fluffy from the crate segment in this. Albeit very poor. Very poor version. It, um, uh, where was his name? Greg McDougal. Who, who did the effects. They're not terrible effects. They're really not. 
but part of what makes effects really work is you know the right lighting camera angles uh and this movie doesn't have that it doesn't have any cinematography to it whatsoever because i mean when it's revealed that that's what he looks like it's just like this really awkward almost shot on video feeling like close up and yeah he bites her neck and then she dies and the two guys from the next story appear in this one as does the pimp from the last story because again they're going for the Pulp Fiction Sin City uh, of interconnecting characters the next story which is called The Professor's Wife, I, is the one story that I could say I appreciate. And I only appreciate it because it reminds me of something. I can see it being something else. I'll explain after. It's not a very good story <laughs> anyway. So the professor from the first story that turned Alice into a rabbit He's about to get married. So, two of his former students, who he calls his best students he's ever had, even though they both act like complete dumbasses, they really do. They, the way they act in this, they are almost like Pauly Shore and whichever Baldwin was in Biodome. But supposedly they're like on their way to be doctors or some stupid shit. But they go to visit the professor to meet his new fiance, Kathy. And before they meet her, they reminisce about how the professor had always pulled practical jokes on them. Uh, like there was one exploding cake or whatever. With really bad, I'm, uh, I'm remembering it like some sort of goldish sepia tone flashbacks that you would see in like a Nickelodeon show, like with close ups of the professor and like snickering. Terrible acting. Just like in this entire fucking. Mike OCP already beat me to it and called this crap show three. I wish I could copyright that as uh, claim that as my own crap show three. <clears throat> and they also talk about how he's always had this, you know, secret project, this secret experiment that he's been working on for years. <clears throat> and how he's always wanted to get married, but uh, he would want to build and create his perfect wife with the joke being so he could put an off, uh, off switch on her so then they meet Kathy and Kathy is this young beautiful woman with a Russian accent she seems kind of off not so much Stepford Wives because this movie would not be that clever or creepy but just kind of random, I guess. So then he goes to pick up the wedding cake, leaves them alone to get to know her. And they get the idea of, oh my God, this is another practical joke. This is his lifelong secret experiment. She is his perfect wife robot. So they go into the kitchen. They hit her over the head with something so they're standing here like this. She goes down below the screen and they just start hacking her up <laughs> and they, <clears throat> you know, they pick up like a leg and they're like, oh my God, the, the skin feels so real. And as they're doing this, really fake looking blood is spurting up more and more, covering them in more and more blood with every limb they pick up. 
the arm, you know, the, the, uh, the ligaments and the uh, muscle tissue is so lifelike and so detailed. And they're cackling, laughing about about it with each one. Even a part when they, they pick up her head, it's like, you want to check out the brain? They lift open the top of her skull. He's like, look, the brain, it's so real. It, it even jiggles when I shake it. And then uh, one of them goes off and he finds a scrapbook of their whole relationship together. And they even think that's there to even further create the illusion and drag out the joke that she is alive, like a real person. And they just keep going on with how it's all part of the elaborate scheme. But then they find out that Kathy was actually human when they see the brochure for a mail order bride. And then he comes home. And I am so surprised they did not put the Benny Hill music over it because of how this is shot. They are li like sped up cleaning all the blood, stashing body parts and cupboards and her head in the oven. It looks, they should have had the Benny Hill music. While he stands in the living room calling their name, their names, which, I, what was it? John and Carlos or something? I forget what their names were. Charles and John. And it's literally so cheesy. While they're running around, sped up, cleaning and hiding everything, he's literally stand, standing in the living room like, John, Charles. Shows them doing more. It's like, John, Charles. So he must have been doing that for like 40 minutes or more while they're cleaning. Then they take the, roll up the carpet, seemingly go into the basement. He goes to the kitchen, opens up the oven, sees her head, starts crying, takes it out, and we get the infrared fade into the story. Like, that's another one where it just ends. Just dead cut right there. It's not a very good story. It's very poorly acted. I get what they're going for. Even The Lonesome Death of Jordy Barrow in the original film, that was more of the dark comedy, silly, fun story. Maybe that was the idea of this. But why do I appreciate it? Because I can see this being a Monty Python skit. I really can. If you've been with my channel, since the beginning, you'll know that I am a huge, huge, huge Monty Python fan. I have a video of every, everything Monty Python I own. I've got more stuff since then. You go check out that video. Whether it's R-rated Monty Python, like uh, uh, The Meaning of Life, or even Flying Circus, like when they did their uh, parody of this one Italian filmmaker, where it's a, a, a picnic gone wrong. And it's just the, the bloodiest deaths over the smallest thing. Like, uh, I can see John Cleese and Michael Palin doing this routine. Or John Cleese and Graham Chapman doing this routine. With Terry Jones dressed up as an, an old uh, professor. But they would actually sell it. I would buy them doing this these two guys it really was like like a a dude where's my car biodome two morons i i get what they were going for though and just for that reason as badly written as badly acted as it was it made me think of monty python it was the only enjoyment i got in the entire 104 minute uh, of running time. So we finally get to the last story, which 
I don't even know what that one was called because, oh, Haunted Dog, how could I forget? Because this one doesn't have titles either. It just goes into the next story. And it's about this asshole doctor. And this story was actually written by Scott Frizzell, who co-director James Doodleson supposedly called him and said, I got 18 minutes to fill, fill it. Um, I want this asshole doctor who has to tell a young girl that she's going to die with no emotion. And he has to give a homeless guy a hot dog and he has to choke to death on it. Fill 18 minutes. So we have this asshole doctor who he kind of looked familiar. But I did really uh, recognize him. Or that sounded stupid. He, he looked familiar, but I, I couldn't make out what he was from. Chris Allen. Okay. He, he goes to the hot dog stand from the beginning, buys a hot dog, drops it on the ground, gives it to this homeless guy. Homeless guy chokes to death on it. And then the whole point of the story is he's haunted by the horrible visual effect of his ghost trying to give him the hot dog back. Yeah. And as it goes on, we just see him treat more and more of his victim victims, <laughs> patients like shit. Uh, he starts to go a little crazy because they put bags under his eyes. And hair gets messed up. Goes to a party. Does a bunch of drugs. And yeah, he just sees the the ghost of this homeless guy with a hot dog. Which, it's like they're trying to redo the hitchhiker from this with the, you know, thanks for the ride lady of the hitchhiker. But at least that's kind of creepy. That's, you know, a, you can also buy that a dead hitchhiker popping up everywhere saying thanks for the ride lady. A dead homeless guy thanking you for a hot dog that killed him is just fucking stupid. Completely fucking stupid. That's really all I'm going to give that story. And um, the ending of it, he pretty much just dies. He, I, I guess, has a heart attack or dies of fright. Um, we see more people... Like, we see Victor from Call Girl. He's at this party. Which, I swear... Um, when he goes to the party... Where he has a bunch of drugs and everyone's dancing. Everyone's a vampire. But they do nothing with it. Um, <clears throat> and then... So yeah, like he's outside, he's like laying on a stoop, and there's just, like they try to make the homeless guy transparent with white eyes and like a white glow around him, but it looks terrible. It, he looks foolish too, because he's just standing there with his hot dog, he's just like, Dude, thanks for the hot dog, mister, and he has this dopey smile, doesn't look threatening at all. <clears throat> and then we get the epilogue, which is like the ending to Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, where we just see all the characters from the previous stories together as one. Could we see that the professor bought uh, something from the screaming homeless salesman to put Kathy back together but she has like a 
facial bandage. He gets married. They get in a car. Uh, in the backseat of the car is Alice the rabbit, which he throws the uh, bouquet. I think it was Alice's family that catches it. And you get this weird scene where Alice's mom says, uh, Alice is going to look so pretty on her wedding day. And then the priest walks up. She walks off. Priest walks up. He's like, how's she doing? And the grandmother, husband, and son are like, not good. She's still convinced we have a daughter named Alice. He's, and then they ask, uh, what do we do? And I kind of like this joke. He says, well, have you done all your Hail Marys? Yeah. Uh, try a couple of Oh Heavenly Fathers. They're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then we see a couple more nods to past stories. And then we see the hot dog stand. And supposedly... The guy working the hot dog stand, because he's like this, and when he turns, he's got like a witch nose, long hair. He's the creep. He's supposed to be the creep show creep. But we have literally the worst CGI I think I've ever seen in a horror film. It is, to bring up Mortal Kombat Annihilation again, that bad. And this is 2007? I think, yeah, 2007. Actually, I, I think this was shelved for a while. I, I think it was made. Or 2006. But anyway. So, he's got, you know, messed up eyes, like a bloody smile. In the worst CGI I've ever seen, his face just, like, melts. It's like a waterfall of, like, brown and tan just imagine a bunch of CGI dots or little round things that's supposed to look like melting waterfall effect. So then he has like a skull face, which then like morphs into the skull in that ball, kind of goes into that. Then we see this picture with a woman's voice that says, Something to the effect of, it's all about the future now. Which doesn't make any sense at all. And then we hear like a, a laugh and then finally the end credits. But yeah, there was nothing about this voodoo lady in the beginning or at the end, there's no reason why this picture is there. Don't know why it says, you know. Uh, I actually just now noticed that the tarot cards actually have stills from the stories. But it's all about the future. Now. What the fuck kind of a doesn't even make sense. This movie is terrible. It really is. It is horribly, horribly, horribly written, horribly shot, horribly acted. It, absolutely nothing comic related about it. Like this is, I, I think there was one like animation thing at the beginning and then this final shot. That's all we get for animation or comic anything. The end of the stories is just that stupid, like, uh, um, infrared-looking transition. So, the whole idea of being an homage to 50s EC horror comics, like this one, which this one did perfectly, and this one still had the animation, still had the comic panel stills, but not the filters, not the panel transitions, 
or anything to look like a comet come to life, which was a detriment. It is far inferior to the original. It's, uh, there's still something of a comic book here. And I can see these being EC comic stories. Not very strong ones, but EC comic stories. This one, not in the least bit. I completely throw out the comic aspect. There's nothing EC either related or... I could ever see being in an EC comic story. It, it just completely just does not deserve the name Creep Show. Easily one of, if not the worst, sequel to a horror film I've ever seen. I mean, as far as, like, as loving the original film and just how far how far down the line this one is in quality but also just getting away from what the original film was and what made it the original film it really just should be named its own thing like literally anything they could have called this spooky tales tales spelt with a z or spelt like animal tales just because it would have been more fitting or just stories trying to go for the, the pulp fiction route as the connected tissue not completely separate comic stories it's, uh, I could go on for why this is shitty. The only thing I can say about it is, okay, the effects look serviceable. I mean, some of the effects on Alice, like when she's fully transformed, does look a little fake. Like, not convincing at all, like in Tom Savini's. The Baraka Fright Night Vampire look was cool looking. Not a terrible effect. And the Professor's Wife story, I only liked because it's a very Python-esque skit. Uh, I could see it being, being part of, being done by Monty Python. But done nowhere near as funny or entertaining. This should be ashamed to call itself creep show. It really should. The most thankful I am is that it doesn't have the creep show font on it, which is why the thumbnail, uh, uh, the cover I'm going to use for the thumbnail is going to have this cover, not the one with the creep show font on it, because it doesn't fucking deserve it. Fuck creep show three. Fuck this movie. Fuck it to hell. Definitely the worst sequel to a horror film. It just fucked this movie to death. Oh, oh.